The normal way to introduce uh, Dean Kamen uh, is to tell you about the segue. And the reality is, uh, uh, there are so many amazing things that Dean has done. And honest to God, the segue, even though it's the one everybody recognized, is actually the least impressive thing <laughs> this man has ever done. So I. Everything from, from the auto syringe to, uh, he worked on heart stents, he's worked on, uh, on robotic arms, all of this amazing stuff. Uh, plus, he is the founder of FIRST, and his passion for this is undeniable, and I'm, I'm hoping that Dean can come up and talk to us about how the rest of us can get involved and really help our business community get involved. Dean? I agree with him. <laughs> I didn't come directly here from the Boston area, and Boston, like Seattle, has done pretty well even through the ups and downs of the economy for the same reason as you guys. It's got you know some local trade schools like MIT and Harvard, and, <laughs> and it does pretty well. But I, I came here from Michigan. So if you want to know why your business community ought to be more involved, First, let me just tell you facts of why I happen to be in Michigan and what's going on in Michigan by telling you some of the stories of first. A long time ago, in a far away place, I started first, and I want everybody everywhere to be involved. And ironically, well, maybe not so ironically, back in the early 90s, it was already pretty clear to most people in the country that we were, in many ways, approach, approaching a crisis in terms of global competitiveness, in terms of the ability for the next generation of people growing up in this country to have the expectation of having a better life uh, than their parents, which has never happened before. The politicians immediately find one word answers how to fix it. They always, doesn't matter the lunatics on the right, the lunatics on the left, and what they have in common is they always have a simple, easy to understand set of problems. They always have somebody to blame, and they always have a simple solution, which is really great, except for one thing. It's all wrong and irrelevant and stupid, <laughs> because there is no simple solution to the problems that this country has gotten itself into, and there is no simple answer. It takes a generation to train a generation of kids, and there's no simple way to have success. What it takes is a work ethic and somebody willing to commit their lives to hard work at doing something that's meaningful. And that's what worked for the first 200 years of this country. But even back in 92, when we had the first competitions, I had a bunch of the big companies in Detroit, the big car companies and their first year suppliers, committed and involved because they could see what was happening to their companies compared to competition around the world. They'd seen what happened when the Japanese car companies had come in a decade before. They'd seen what was happening to the core of their city and their, their employment base. And they were helping. And it was working. I think the early people got involved because I'm a nudge. And I convinced the CEOs of big companies to help us. And I think they, like a lot of you, did it because they could, because they cared, because they have kids. But it wasn't to save their company. It was, again, like we all do philanthropy with a little bit of our time and a little bit of our energy. But over the 20 years that first was going, a lot of what was eating away at the core of this country continued to eat away at it. By 2007, 8, 9, some of you probably remember, there was a global potential meltdown of the entire banking system of the world. This country was starting to head for what a lot of people thought was the next Great Depression. The most iconic company in the world, for instance, General Motors, people were assuming was going into bankruptcy. A few years later, as you know, Detroit went into bankruptcy. A city went into bankruptcy. 
<laughs> and so here you have the industry of, of the 19th century, symbol of which is General Motors. You had the hometown of what was then the most powerful city in the world, 100 years. Both the government side, the city, the industry side, going bankrupt. I think that was, you know, to foretell the future of what, what could happen. So I'll tell you why I was there, as I said yesterday. It turns out that we were having a board meeting. Well, on our board back in 2008, 9 was the vice chairman of General Motors, worldwide head of engineering, GM. And it turned out that the week of our championship event in the 70,000 seat arena was the week back then that the country was waiting to see whether General Motors, after 100 and some years, was going to go bankrupt. The rest of industry was not doing all that well either, as you might recall. But we had a board meeting scheduled for 7 in the morning before opening ceremonies of the championship. And the entire board, as they do every year, showed up. And there we are in that Georgia Dome in Atlanta. And even Tom Stevens from General Motors is there. People were astounded how, in the midst of what's going on, how did that kind of fly there? But they've been great sponsors and great supporters of first from the very beginning. <laughs> And there's small talk going on before we officially have to read through the minutes and approve everything that you have to do. It's a 501c3. And they're all saying, Dean, you know, we've had this incredible growth. You have 55% combat growth, and you had 23 teams, and now you got thousands of teams. And we got to really be realistic over the next few years. We're not going to be able to have the kind of growth we've had in the past. And around the table, as everybody's looking at what we had put in the board book, about projections the next year and goals to next year. They're all being kind of very conservative. And this was a very nervous time. I think they're all being very kind not to want to say anything to Tom Stevens, but what's on everybody's mind is a major supporter of first General Motors is sitting at the table. And it could be he's going to run out of his room to find out that GM is gone. But finally, around to the end of the table where he's sitting, some it's time for him to say something. He looks at this whole first board and he says, I don't know what's the matter with all of you. This is what General Motors is going to do this year. We're going to double our commitment at first. How do you think we got into this mess? We lost our competitive advantage. We lost our innovation. We lost what made us in this country great. And the only way out of it the only way out of it is going to be to innovate out of it and educate the next generation of Americans to be like the last one, not like this one. And now that we're competing with the world where everybody's figured this out, now is the time to double down on the only thing that matters, educating kids. And the room went silent. Well, it wasn't just lip service because they did double down. And they doubled and we doubled and gotten all of their suppliers, all of their competitors, Daimler, Chrysler, Ford, I was with Bill Ford yesterday, Michigan as well, and they kept doing this. So why was I in Michigan? Well, it turns out once a year they have this major two-day session where they plan their future. And both senators from that state the governor of that state, the mayor of Detroit, and the <coughs> states from all over the state get together for this two day. And they said, Dean, you gotta come down and you gotta talk to us. Be part of it. If you think I'm making any of this up, by the way, I'd encourage you to go, I'm sure, online and look at Governor Snyder's state to state address. in which he basically spent more time on first and their commitment to education than on anything else. <laughs> and basically, here's the data that they were, one after another of their people were putting out. That the unemployment rate in the state in general and in Detroit is, area in particular, had gone from well over 14% to now under the national average, they 
seven best revival of industry of any state in the country. <laughs> Even though the city had gone bankrupt, it's coming back. And you don't have to trust me. You ask all of their people what they credit that to. They're rebuilding their education system, and they don't mean pouring more money into the schools that nobody goes to, they drop out of it. They have the highest density of first teams in the United States, in Michigan, and in particular, every school in Detroit. And the mayor <coughs> will tell you it's transformed their schools. There are schools there that used to have to wear, I mean, you go through metal detectors to get in, and now there are kids flocking in from the wealthy suburbs to be part of the Detroit schools because they get to be on first teams. And the first teams are powerhouse dynasty teams around the country. Nobody wants to have to compete. And they said it's not a coincidence that they're leading the country in being involved in first. They don't think it's a coincidence that they're leading the country in reducing unemployment and building their industry back. And they're excited about it because they figured out the reality. And I heard, I think Kevin say, well, you know, you can say first is expensive. That's the only thing I've ever heard you say that I disagree with. Uh, but you said it takes a lot of money. If anybody thinks, by the way, the average cost in the major cities of the United States of per student, you take, you take the education budget for any city, even a little city like Manchester, New Hampshire, where I have, it's about $100 million, it's a small city. You divide that by the number of students, and it's between fifteen dollars and $20,000 per year per student. Then you realize that in the 20 largest school districts in the United States, 50% of the kids don't even graduate on time. So it's $15,000 per student for most of the students that aren't even going. They're not there. But the cost of putting first into a school, and it changes the whole outcome of the school, is less than the cost that they pay per student. But it's just not built into the high inertia of that bureaucracy. And so you do hear that it's hard. But I would just tell you, if you think that educating kids is expensive, look at the cost of the alternative to educating those kids. Baltimore, Ferguson, it costs more money to put somebody in jail than to send them through MIT. And after a few years at MIT, they get out and they start paying taxes. After a few years in prison, they spend another few years in prison. So you let them out for a few months, and the only thing they learn how to do is go back. This country has not figured out to be a game theory or enlightened self-interest that the only investment we can make that makes sense is to make sure the next generation of kids are going to be awesome creators of wealth, awesome competitors with their peers around the world. And where are they going to get that? Where are they going to get that sense? You can't ask the schools to give them that sense. That's not what schools are for. Schools are on the supply side. Where do you create demand? Where do you create The business of America has always been business. Business has moved away from thinking we have to have the long view. Wall Street has about a 30 minute attention span. <laughs> Hedge funds are not where I think we ought to derive our sense of right and wrong and long term <coughs> commitment. Where are the kids in this country, particularly the women and minorities? And I realize Seattle may not be yet one of those cities that's worried about survival. But as a country, if we can't expect our leaders of business to devote significant resources to ensuring that the future will be better than the past, it's not going to happen all by itself. <laughs> to some extent, every city in this country ought to learn from the vision and the courage of those business leaders, of that governor. The governor put, I think, nine or ten million bucks into his budget to make sure every team, every school in the state could have a first team. 
and in this nearly bankrupt city of Detroit, similarly with a plan put together by business and government, they said, we want for us in every school in Detroit. They didn't do that for philanthropy. That wasn't a nice thing to do. I appreciate that Kevin points out it's fun. I appreciate and I hope everybody here that's been involved with first would agree with me that the mentors get more out of it than the kids. <laughs> it's a fun event. It's, it's one of those rare things where doing good is also fun. But you got to go out to the rest of your community and say, hey, you owe it to yourselves and to your future, your company. But if we don't start getting more of our own kids in this community turned on to become wealth producers, and if we don't give them a reason to be interning with us as summer students and staying at local universities and staying here when they graduate, the world is a very mobile, volatile place these days. And the rate at which situations change and wealth can move is astounding. To get behind something like FIRST and say, we're doing this as a long-term investment. You guys have to help make that happen. You gotta get your community behind it. You gotta do it with a sense of urgency. First is making it easy. We packaged it up, we made it fun. The teachers love it, the parents love it, the companies that are involved love it, your companies, your big ones, you heard of them, like Boeing, I mean, it's fantastic. But it's not enough. Everybody's gotta be involved. So my one request here today is neither to thank the ones that are, it's to say, reach out to the rest of your community and let us get to scale at a rate that we've never seen before. Because every kid deserves this opportunity and every community needs what first delivers.